Thank you for listening to this podcast. I am grateful for your time and willingness to participate in this reflection and dialogue. In this episode, we will explore how Hinduism invites us to consider what it means to live in harmony, peace, gentleness, and in a nonviolent way with each other, with non-human creatures and all creation. I'd like to begin with a quote from Gandhi, perhaps the most well-known Hindu. He said, The cow is the purest type of subhuman life. She pleads before us on behalf of the whole of the subhuman species for justice to it at the hands of man, the first among all that lives. She seems to speak to us through her eyes. You are not appointed over us to kill us and eat our flesh or otherwise ill-treat us, but to be our friend and guardian. On a recent visit to the Hindu Temple Society in Flushing, Queens, one of our students asked the temple priest, who was serving as our guide, about the phenomenon of cow veneration in Hinduism. The priest's response was insightful and, for me, inspiring. He remarked that all creatures have a right to live. We have no right to take their lives. God has created space for all of them to live, and we are to honor that. Therefore, as one attains the highest levels of spiritual enlightenment in Hinduism, one will naturally become vegetarian, because this does not take life. Now here's the key insight. Cow veneration is but a symbol, a symbol of nonviolence. The Hindu religion, at its best, calls us to purge ourselves of violence, whether it's violence toward non-human creatures, violence toward other people, violence toward the earth itself. We see this invitation to nonviolence, for example, in the life paths that one might choose. A person can, for example, pursue a life of pleasure or material gain. These are good and acceptable, according to Hindu teaching. But these life paths are to be done within dharma, that is, within an ethical framework that guides all one's choices, large and small. When we make acting in an ethical way our guiding light, we are making an effort to reduce the violence we might do to others. It might not be physical violence, but rather emotional or spiritual violence. For example, if one pursues kama, the Sanskrit word for sexual sensual pleasure, this is to be done in a way that does not use others as a means to an end, that does not exploit others, that is not manipulative or hurtful. Gandhi said, even a little dharma saves one from many a pitfall. We can bring a moral compass to all parts of our lives, and this in turn has the power to bring peace and harmony to our relationships with others. The purging of violence also extends to our thoughts. Our priest guide at the temple pointed out that karma, which is the force generated by actions and has an impact on future lives, is created not by actions alone, but by thoughts as well. One is called to look upon, to think about others with charity, patience, and dignity. For example, suppose I do not like a certain political figure. I can, in my thoughts and actions, reject her or his policies and condemn bad behavior and choices, but I do not look upon that person with hatred. I do not wish for violence to be done to them. Hinduism teaches us that when we can see the world and others through such eyes, eyes of dignity, love, kindness, and compassion, we are drawing closer to what they call moksha, union with God. The 20th century witnessed nearly 110 million people be killed in war. This was the most technologically advanced century, with the greatest expenditures on arms and militaries They were supposed to bring and keep peace. I would suggest that the approach of using threats of military violence, overwhelming force, and nuclear annihilation did not bring us the peace we were seeking. As Martin Luther King Jr., who was deeply inspired by Gandhi, said, returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. 
Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I hope that among the life lessons we might take from our study of Hinduism is the call to purge violence in all its forms from our lives. We might begin by considering how we simply perceive, think about, and treat our fellow human beings. Gandhi said, The first principle of nonviolent action is that of non-cooperation with everything humiliating. We apply this to ourselves and others first, and then let it extend to other creatures and all of creation. As we discussed in class, we might also study the ways of nonviolence. Who are the great peacemakers? And what are the tactics of peacemakers? What are the strategies of nonviolent resistance? We know the war makers all too well. We are taught about Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, and Napoleon. We glorify them. But can we name any Nobel Peace Prize winners and why they were awarded that honor? Perhaps our study of Hinduism can serve as a doorway to unlearning the ways of violence, of seeing it as the solution, and replacing it with ways of peace. I'd like to conclude with a quote from the former Jesuit priest and peace activist John Deere. He writes, In his search for God and truth, Mohandas Gandhi concluded that he could never hurt or kill anyone, much less remain passive in the face of injustice, imperialism, and war. Instead, Gandhi dedicated himself to the practice and promotion of nonviolence. He concluded that violence is not only the most powerful force there is, it is the spiritual practice most neglected and most needed throughout the world. Nonviolence means avoiding injury to anything on earth, in thought, word, or deed, Gandhi told an interviewer in 1935. But for Gandhi, nonviolence meant not just refraining from physical violence interpersonally and nationally, but refraining from the inner violence of the heart as well. It meant the practice of active love toward one's oppressors and enemies in the pursuit of justice, truth, and peace. Nonviolence cannot be preached, he insisted. It has to be practiced. For 50 years, Gandhi sought to practice nonviolence at every level in his life, in his own heart, among his family and friends, and publicly in his struggle for equality in South Africa and freedom for India. It was the means by which he sought the ends of truth. In fact, he later concluded that the ends were in the means, or perhaps they were even the same. In other words, the practice of nonviolence is not just the way of peace, it is the way to God. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to reading your report on your conversations.